we are going to be looking at the nervous system between now and winter break. So this is just going to be kind of an overview lesson um, to go over some of the main things about the nervous system and specifically focusing on the central nervous system with this lesson. Um, and we'll move on from there. Um, so we're going to start with functions of the nervous system. Um, the main functions are to have sensory input, so gathering information from the environment. Um, it lets changes be monitored that are occurring both inside and outside of the body. And those changes that we're referring to are called stimuli. So it could be something happening in your body. Um, maybe you were exposed to an infection of some kind of pathogen that would make you sick. Um, it could be that you walked outside in the middle of winter without a coat on and that change in external temperature would be another kind of stimuli. Um, integration is to process and interpret that sensory input and decide what kind of act action, if any, would be needed. Um, so causing some kind of response, essentially. Um, another function would be motor output. Um, so having a response to a stimulus um, and that response would have to activate muscles or glands to cause, if you think of motor, um, like the motor of a car allows the car to move, um, these motor outputs would cause, um, for example, the movement of a muscle. If we look at how the nervous system is organized, um, there are structural classifications that we'll start with. Um, this is going to include the nervous system organs. So any system or sorry, any organ in this system would be classified based upon its structure. Um, and for the nervous system, it has two subdivisions that it can be broken down into. We have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Um, the central nervous system or the CNS includes the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and then the peripheral nervous system or the PNS is going to include all of your nerves, such as the cranial nerves and spinal nerves. Um, there are nerves other than these, but these are just examples here. Um, if we look further at the structural classification of your central nervous system, the organs would be the brain and the spinal cord, um, as we mentioned back here. Didn't want to change the slide for me. Um, functions would be integration. Um, so your brain essentially acts as a command center. The spinal cord can as well um, when we're looking just at reflexes. But um, having a command center, like a um, something that's basically in charge of getting all of the information. Uh, it needs to interpret the information that's coming in and then issue some kind of instructions going out to have there be some kind of response. If we look at the functional classification, this is really only concerned with the peripheral nervous system structures. Um, right now is in within this lesson, the only time we're gonna focus on the peripheral nervous system. We will do things later on with that um, a little bit more, but for now, this will be it. So um, functional classification of the nervous system is just looking at structures of the peripheral nervous system. So your nerves, um, including your cranial nerves and your spinal nerves. Um, it's your peripheral nervous system is divided into two main subdivisions, um, sensory, the sensory division and the motor division. Um, the sensory division, another name for that is called the afferent division. Um, these are going to be nerves that carry impulses to the central nervous system from different receptors in the body. So for example, um, if you have a pain receptor in your skin, that's going to carry information to your central nervous system from those receptors. Um, this is going to, the sensory division is going to constantly keep your central nervous system updated of both internal and external conditions, which is really important so it can respond to those things right away. Uh, next, if we look at the motor division or the efferent division, um, this carries impulses from the central nervous system away from the central nervous system to either muscles or glands to effect a motor response. So if you think of efferent as affecting, um, as in cause and effect, the effect here would be caused by the motor division of your peripheral nervous system. Um, and within that, we have two further subdivisions. 
the somatic nervous system, which is going to be voluntary control. So you um, typing something on your keyboard, that would be controlled by your somatic nervous system. And then autonomic nervous system is involuntary. So for example, your breathing rate. Um, that is going to also be further broken down into two subdivisions. Um, you have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And you'll see here that I have next to sympathetic fight or flight and parasympathetic next to that I have rest and digest. The sympathetic nervous system is going to um, basically be used under stressful conditions. Um, so that fight or flight response of determining whether you should stay and fight whatever the stressor is or if you should flee and get away to try to save yourself. Um, rest and digest just refers to normal conditions in the body. So your um, normal every day, like right now while you're sitting there at your Chromebook, um, that would be your parasympathetic nervous system controlling all of those things. So your sympathetic nervous system, that's going to cause your heart rate to increase, your breathing rate to increase um, in response to those stressful conditions. Uh, parasympathetic should be keeping your heart rate and breathing rate and all that within a normal range because hopefully you're not under stressful conditions right now. All right, so looking at nervous tissue, we did touch on that a little bit in our last unit. Um, so the nervous tissue is going to be your neurons. There are different major parts. We'll go through and talk about each of those. Um, here you can see what the um, nervous tissue or, or a, ner a neuron would look like. Um, it is cut off there. Sorry, it'll be on other slides um, later on, which... In your version, at least you can see the whole slide because you have access to this Google Slides file. So um, here we go. Now you can see the whole thing. So if we start with the cell body, that's this main part, and I have it circled for you to try to highlight it. Um, that's going to have the nucleus of the neuron. Um, so you can see that right here in the center. There are other organelles as well. Um, so it's the main part of the neuron, um, what you would think of as a typical animal cell. It's going to have most of those organelles. Um, the a neuron does not have centrioles, which is helping, which helps with cell division. So, um, neurons are not able to regenerate themselves and that comes from the fact that they can't do mitosis. And so they would not need centrioles in that case. Um, but this is basically the metabolic center of the neuron where you are going to have, um, the mitochondria you can see so they're making energy um, and carrying out those different chemical reactions to keep the cell alive. Next we have dendrites. So they are these little branches you can see coming in toward the cell body. Um, they're going to bring information from neighboring neurons into this particular neuron. Um, and one neuron can have hundreds, hundreds of dendrites. It depends on the type of neuron and where in the body it would be. An axon. So even though um, a neuron can have hundreds of dendrites, it's only ever going to have one axon. Um, and that's this long kind of tail coming out. It acts kind of like a wire, an insulated wire to carry electrical signals um, and pass that on to the neighboring neurons. Um, so this carries, so you get dendrites bring information in to the cell body and axon carries it away from the cell body. So it's going to pass that information along the length of the axon um, to have that information be sent further um, and just on to the next neuron or neighboring neurons. Um, you can see, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, um, this kind of, it looks bluish on this diagram. Um, it's the myelin sheath. So it's kind of, if you think of, I'll just use a, like a phone charger. So inside of the phone charger, the cord of the phone charger, you have wires that those wires would be like, um, the axon and then the, um, the white plastic coating on the outside of the wires of your phone charger. That's like the myelin sheath. So it's going to insulate your nerve fibers um, and let the, the information be transmitted um, smoothly and not have any issues with information being transmitted to the next neuron. Um, there are 
issues that can happen with the myelin sheath. Um, one homeostatic imbalance, and we'll mention a few of those throughout this lesson, um, would be multiple sclerosis or MS. You may have heard of it before. Uh, but what happens is the myelin sheath around the nerve fibers are destroyed over time. Um, and that causes the electrical current, those signals traveling the length of the axon um, to kind of be short circuited. So they don't get to where they need to go. Um, it is going to cause the person to have visual problems um, because if you think of the optic nerve, if the, that nerve is damaged um, going from their eye to the brain, it's going to cause vision impairment. Um, they might have speech disturbances. They might lose the ability to control their muscles and they're going to become increasingly disabled over time. Um, it is an autoimmune disease. So for unknown reasons, um, a person's immune system damages the myelin around their um, axons. And there is unfortunately, at, at this time at least, hopefully one day there will be, but right now there is no cure for that. All right, so we are going to spend the rest of the lesson looking at the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so the functional anatomy of the brain, um, each of these different parts are going to have different functions with them and you can see them all labeled here. So we have the cerebrum, that's this largest part of the brain. It has two hemispheres. We're looking at the left hemisphere right here in this picture. Um, the diencephalon you can see is kind of inside shaded so you can see where it would be. Um, then we have the brainstem, which is all of here. And then back here, we have the cerebellum. So we're going to go in that order to talk about those different parts. Um, the cerebrum is, uh, and down here you can see like all of this part here. That's a, what a human brain would look like. All of that part is the cerebrum. Um, it does have paired hemispheres. So there is um, kind of a division down the middle. Um, and there would be a right and a left hemisphere. There are different features to the surface of the cerebrum. Um, there's gyri or singular would be gyrus. These are the elevated ridges. Um, and you can see up in this diagram also. So a gyrus would be kind of this upward bump that you would have. Next, we have sulci or a sulcus. Those are shallow grooves. Um, so you would have that in between. Okay. And then fissures are deep grooves like you would have right here. Um, there's also lobes. Um, so each hemisphere is divided into lobes by either a fissure or a sulcus. Um, and the, what names the lobes is the name of the um, bone that covers that part. So you would have the frontal lobe here, parietal lobe on each side, occipital lobe back here, and temporal lobe kind of down here on the side. Um, so the cerebral cortex, kind of like that outer part of the cerebrum, is going to function with your speech, memory, uh, logical and emotional response to things, your consciousness, interpreting the sensations that you are experiencing, as well as voluntary movement. Um, so you can see on the diagram here that um, like all of these different parts are kind of labeled um, where on the cerebrum those... Um, different functions would be controlled. Okay. So you have, for example, um, your occipital lobe back here, you can see that visual area is labeled. So occipital lobe has a big role in your vision. Um, here you can see just um, on the left side, it's showing you um, the motor. So like the movement of things, um, what is controlled by what part of the um, cerebral cortex. And then on this side, you can also see um, the sense, like interpreting senses for all of these parts. The larger on this diagram, um, the, the area is that show, or the gyrus is, that's going to show you like how much of that area controls these different parts. Um, we'll do, again, we'll do more with this um, later on. So I'm not going to spend too much time going over that right now. Um, the corpus callosum, you can see in this diagram here, it's this reddish structure. Uh, it kind of looks like a letter C on its side. Um, it connects the two hemispheres of the cerebrum and it's going to arch above this stuff that you see right in here. And that stuff that I'm referring to would be structures of the brainstem. Um, and what it's going to do is it allows the hemispheres of the uh, cerebrum to communicate with each other. 
which is really important because um, some of the functions of the, of the cerebrum are only in one hemisphere of the brain. So, for example, um, Broca's area, which helps control your speech, is usually only located in the left hemisphere of the brain or of the cerebrum of the brain. Um, so it's important that that communication center, the corpus callosum, is there. Um, so if that area is damaged, for example, um, you might kind of know what you want to say, but you can't actually form the words of what you want to say. So again, that's just going to help with communication between the two halves of the cerebrum. Um, and the importance for that, again, is because some functions are only controlled by one hemisphere of the brain or the cerebrum, so it lets that communication happen. Next, we have the diencephalon. It's also called the inner brain. Um, it sits on top of the brain stem, so that would be in here on this diagram, which again, on your copy, you have the whole thing. Um, so it's cut off on mine. Um, so the major structures of the diencephalon, um, which it is kind of enclosed or encapsulated by the cerebrum, um, and it sits again on top of that brain stem, which is greenish here in this picture. Um, the major structures of the diencephalon include the thalamus, and that's going to enclose a shallow third ventricle of the brain. Your brain has four ventricles altogether. Um, you may think of ventricle and just think of the heart, um, but a ventricle is just a chamber. We'll talk a little bit more about the ventricles later of the brain. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the thalamus is a relay station for impulses um, passing upward to the sensory cortex. So it's going to pass that sensory impulse on. Um, it's going to allow you to kind of sense if something is pleasant or unpleasant. Next, we have the hypothalamus, which makes up the floor, the base of the diencephalon that helps control your body temperature, your water balance, and your metabolism. We'll talk a little bit more about the hypothalamus in a second. And then the epithalamus forms the roof of the third ventricle of the brain. Um, it includes the pineal gland, which we'll talk about in the endocrine system, which we will start after winter break. Um, and the choroid, the choroid forms cerebrospinal fluid, which we will talk about later in this lesson also. So looking particularly at the hypothalamus, um, it's an important part of the limbic system. It is referred to as the emotional visceral brain. Um, it has a big role in thirst, appetite, sex, pain, and pleasure centers because they're all located in the hypothalamus. Um, hypothalamus regulates the pituitary gland, which we will focus on a lot when we do the uh, endocrine system. And it does produce two of its own hormones. It also has something called mammillary bodies, um, which they are going to help with the sense of smell. And they would come out of the base of the hypothalamus. So you could see that right here in red. Next, we have the brain stem. So, um, in this diagram right here, you would have this, it's all highlighted in green. Okay. Um, it's a relay center for both ascending and descending messages or impulses that need to be sent um, to higher levels of the brain or down to the spinal cord. And there are three structures. Um, they're going to go from top to bottom, the way that they're listed here. Uh, first, we would have the midbrain. So on the diagram, you can see it's got three parts to it, and the midbrain is kind of up here. Okay, um, That is going to convey impulses, and it also contains reflex centers associated with your vision and your hearing. Next is the pons. It's this part that kind of bulges out, and that has a role in controlling your breathing rate. And then this bottom part of the brainstem is the medulla oblongata. Um, that has centers that will control your heart rate and blood pressure, breathing rate, um, and swallowing and vomiting reflexes as well. At below that, the medulla oblongata kind of continues with the spinal cord, um, just so you can kind of see that a little bit there at the bottom of that diagram. Um, and then finally, we have for the brain, we have the cerebellum. Um, the cerebellum has two hemispheres, just like the cerebrum has two hemispheres. And it's going to give precise timing um, for mu skeletal muscle activity. So having your um, balance be coordinated, maintaining equilibrium. Um, so when you go to reach for, let's say, a glass of water, you put your arm out. Um, it's a smooth motion. It's not all kind of jerky and uncoordinated. 
the reason why that happens so smoothly is because of the function of your cerebellum. Um, we're going to take a second here and look at some other, we mentioned um, MS already. We're going to look at two other central nervous system diseases really quick. Uh, one is Alzheimer's and the other is Parkinson's. Um, you probably have heard of both, but I'm sure that you've, if you haven't heard of both, you probably would have heard of Alzheimer's out of the two. Um, and it's progressive, so it means it once it starts, it just continues on. Um, and it's where the brain kind of degenerates a little bit um, over time, more and more over time, I should say. It does cause the person to lose memory, um, especially recent memories. So sometimes the people might think they're kind of living in the past a little bit. Um, they might have a short attention span, become disoriented, and eventually lose the ability to speak. And this is seen with structural changes in the brain, but the cause for this is unknown and there is no uh, cure for it either. Um, again, at least at this point in time, people are doing research um, on both of these or all most diseases, I would imagine. Um, but for now, we don't know how to prevent Alzheimer's um, and we don't know how to cure it. So um, next we have Parkinson's disease. Um, and this is from neurons in the midbrain that release dopamine. Um, we didn't talk about dopamine yet. We will get to that um, later on in the course. But it is a neurotransmitter. Um, it kind of gives you like feel good. Uh, it's called the feel good hormone um, because it's going to, um, or feel good neurotransmitter because it's going to um, have a role in pleasure response to things. Um, so it kind of makes you happy, essentially, um, as well as other things. But um, the neurons that are supposed to release dopamine uh, degenerate. And that's going to cause um, a person to have tremors. So they're kind of shake a little bit. Um, when they walk, they would have a shuffling gait and their facial expressions would be stiff. Um, the cause for Parkinson's is also unknown and there also is no cure for Parkinson's. Um, there are protective features in place for the central nervous system. Um, one of those is called the meninges. The meninges are a collection of three connected tissue membranes that will cover the brain and the spinal cord. Um, there are three layers to the meninges and they, from superficial to deep, are called the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. Um, an imbalance, a homeostatic imbalance that can happen with the meninges is a disease called meningitis. That is inflammation of the meninges of those protective coverings. And it can be caused by bacteria, by a virus, or by a fungus. Um, Fungal meningitis is more rare, but it's way harder to treat. Um, you should be getting a meningitis shot, um, especially to make you get one before you go away to college, um, if you don't have one before then. And this can be fatal um, because if the uh, meninges of the brain or around the spinal cord swell too much, it's going to put pressure on the brain and the spinal cord and then cause issues from there. Um, bacterial meningitis, you can take, an take antibiotics for... Um, but some symptoms would be like you would start out with a headache, neck pain, things like that. Um, but it wouldn't have like the associated cold or flu symptoms that would go along with that. That might let you tell, like let you find out it's something different. Um, but if you would be having like a bad headache or neck pain, things like that, definitely would be important to go to the doctor. Um, and in part of their workup, they could hopefully check and see if you had meningitis. Um, so that could be treated. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, next, we have cerebrospinal fluid, um, which is formed from your blood by the choroid plexuses in each of the four ventricles of the brain. Um, that is going to kind of surround the brain, the spinal cord, and that's going to be enclosed by the meninges. So there's a space in between the meninges and the brain and the spinal cord, and that space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. It helps to kind of cushion um, the brain and the spinal cord. Another layer of protection for the central nervous system, or specifically the brain, is called the blood-brain barrier. Um, that protects the central nervous system from toxins or pathogens that might be circulating in the blood. So the um, capillaries that supply the blood 
um, to the brain are very tight walled where they don't let much through. Um, so it helps keep those things out and it's an extra layer of protection to keep the brain from getting infected. Um, the blood brain barrier cannot prevent certain things from passing though, such as fats, respiratory gases, which is good because you want oxygen to get into your brain. Um, and then other fat soluble molecules. So those things that were just listed are able to cross the blood brain barrier. Um, and that's why alcohol, nicotine, and anesthetics can affect the brain since they're able to get across that barrier. And finally, we have the spinal cord. Um, it is enclosed by the vertebral column. So you can see it extends here. Um, it would start at the base of the medulla oblongata and continue right into the, um, the top of your lumbar vertebrae. <coughs> um, there are two major functions to your spinal cord. One is a reflex center. So most of your reflexes, those signals don't get sent all the way up to your brain. They would just go to your spinal cord and back. Um, and it's also a conduction pathway to get information to your brain if it needs to, and then back down your brain to other parts of your body.